Welcome to this week's Money Meadows podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, here's this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from the low-cost precious metals dealer voted best in the U.S., Money Meadows Exchange. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear a wonderful interview with Axel Merck of Merck Investments and the Merck Funds. Axel describes why he believes the buy-the-dip mentality has overtaken mainstream financial advisors, warns about the dangers of buying into conventional wisdom, and also chimes in on gold and the potential rise of safe haven assets. Don't miss this must-hear conversation coming up after today's market update. As investors eye a potential tax reform deal on the horizon, they are mostly overlooking precious metals markets. Gold and silver prices retreated this week, with gold posting a 0.8% decline to bring spot prices down to $1,271 an ounce. Silver's off 2% on the week to trade at $16.75 as of this Friday recording. The platinum group metals are staying relatively quiet this week, with platinum posting a half a percent decline to $921 an ounce, with palladium off 1.2% to trade at $965. On Thursday, the House of Representatives approved a budget resolution that paves the way procedurally for tax reform to be passed by the Senate with a bare majority. The House budget deal was not without controversy. Several Republicans from high-tax blue states, including New York and New Jersey, opposed the GOP plan because it threatens the deductions for state and local taxes. Meanwhile, members of the House Liberty Caucus blasted the bill for essentially ditching efforts on spending restraint. The group of fiscally conservative lawmakers complained that the budget will add $5.5 trillion to the national debt over the next decade. Investors are concerned that 401k and other qualified retirement accounts will get tinkered with in order to pay for tax rate reductions. On the table is a proposal to reduce contribution limits. That's bad for people who are trying to sock away retirement savings tax-free. From a free market perspective, though, it would be nice if Congress would just stop trying to socially engineer retirement savings. If Congress scrapped all the arcane rules governing contributions and withdrawals from various accounts, stopped taxing gains on precious metals at a higher rate than stocks, and just treated all savings and investments the same with one low rate, few investors would complain. A final version of the GOP tax plan is expected to be released next week. And as soon as next Friday, President Trump could announce his decision on who will succeed Janet Yellen as the nation's top central banker. Some reports late this week indicated that Yellen is no longer in the running to be the next Fed chair. Politico reported that Janet Yellen is out of the race for the next Federal Reserve chair. That would leave Fed Governor Jerome Powell and Stanford professor John Taylor still in the running for her position. Uh, the political report was carefully nuanced. It said one source was telling them that she was out. Another source said she was still in. And then he noted that the president went on television last night and said he liked her. That was followed by a Washington Post story that suggested three sources had told them that she was out. But both the political story and the Washington Post story were careful to add. But the president frequently changes his mind. And so nobody really knows. Wall Street is now betting that Fed Governor Jerome Powell will get the job, though other candidates are in the mix. Powell would be a politically safe establishment choice. If Trump decides to go with more of an outsider and change agent, he can pick economist John Taylor. He is known as the champion of the Taylor Rule, which would tie interest rate decisions to a formula and remove much of the arbitrariness from monetary decisions. A Taylor pick would send monetary policy in a more hawkish direction than favored by either Yellen or Powell. That could upset the stock market, something President Trump isn't likely to want to do. Then again, Trump enjoys being unpredictable and will sometimes buck the conventional choice he's expected to make. Either way, we'll soon find out. In any event, current Fed Chair Janet Yellen will have an opportunity to give something of a parting shot in December when she is widely expected to sign off on a rate hike. The U.S. dollar index has been rising in recent weeks in anticipation. The risk to metals investors is that the dollar keeps rising into the Fed's December meeting. The opportunity is that the announcement could be a sell the news type of event, much like the Fed's December 2015 rate hike. That marked the start of a major rally for gold and silver prices, and despite recent weakness, they are still holding well above those December 2015 lows. 
Well, now for more analysis on the upcoming Fed chair decision and what it's likely to mean for metals and markets, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. It is my privilege now to welcome in Axel Merck, President and Chief Investment Officer of Merck Investments and author of the book Sustainable Wealth. Axel is a highly sought after guest at financial conferences and on news outlets throughout the world, and it's great to have him on with us again. Axel, thanks for joining us today. Good to be with you. To start out here, I wanted to ask you about the exuberance in the stock market that just can't seem to be derailed by anything. For instance, we have Wall Street seemingly accounting for the fact that the GOP Congress, along with Trump and the White House, are going to get everything done when it comes to health care reform, tax reform, spending cuts, etc. But in reality, none of this has happened yet, and it's far from certain that anything meaningful will get done on the legislative front. Uh, but the markets seem to be pricing this in. What are your thoughts there? Well, I, I think this is it's just a symptom of a time we're in, and we've had similar things in the, in the late 90s and in, in the mid-2000s. And it's the buy-the-dip mentality that's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. We talk a lot to investment professionals, and in order to preserve their job and not lose their clients, they have changed their strategies. Um, think about anybody who has been, quote-unquote, diversified. Well, they still have a bunch in so-called risk assets, and that means on the way up, they have underperformed because the diversified stuff underperformed, and on the way down, because the risk assets are still a big chunk, and they're losing money. And so the clients are saying, hey, on the way up, I'm not keeping up with the indices. On the way down, I'm losing money. Why the heck am I with you? Stocks go up all the time anyway. And so that drives everybody to, to be in that sphere that they buy the dip, buy the dip. And everybody I talk to, even the pessimists, are invested in the market. And the, the feedback I'm getting is, oh, you know, I don't want to be the first one to sell here. It's okay to wait. And that very much reminds me of 2000, and I don't know how many of your listeners were around then, but in 2000, it wasn't all that obvious that we had the peak of the market in, in March 2000. Six, nine months later, many people still thought buying the dip is the right thing. And so those folks who are waiting might be waiting a long time and lose a lot in the process. Trump is expected to make an announcement regarding who will be appointed Fed chair sometime in the next couple of weeks. We learned last week that Janet Yellen is very much a contender. Uh, Trump was very critical of Yellen as a candidate for president, but now less than a year into his term, he says he, quote, really likes her a lot. Uh, first off, why do you think he's done this about face? And then do you care to make any guesses about who will wind up running the Fed? Sure. Well, a couple of, of updates on that. There have been stories out that by November 4 we'll hear it. The latest I heard was November 3. The Politico just released that um, Yellen is out of the running, and yesterday uh, it was said that Cohn is out of the running. Uh, but let me make a, a broader point before I go into kind of some scenarios here. If you are a good salesperson, the stuff that you like, you'll talk down, and the stuff you don't like, you'll praise. Think about it. You want to buy a car, well, if you want to have that car, you'll say it's a piece of crap because then the price is lower. Whereas if you don't want that car anyway, it is no problem to praise it. And so it doesn't cost Trump anything to to praise uh, Janet Yellen because, hey, you're a lovely woman, you're, you're fantastic, and now go to hell type of thing, right? And then, of course, he's not, quote-unquote, buying something, and except, of course, you're, you're buying a fetch, <laughs> so to speak. So I am absolutely not surprised that he's providing flattering comments to people he would never consider hiring. Now, that said, the kind of the runners that are in the game right now are Jay Powell, who is a current governor, and then John Taylor and uh, Kevin Walsh. I know the latter two personally. Powell is a lawyer. And by all means, we do not need to have a Ph.D. economist to run the Fed, but a lawyer. A lawyer's job is to please people. And I hope I'm not offending too many lawyers who might be listening here. But um, and Jay Powell, he doesn't have any views on monetary policy. He's completely agnostic. He was appointed by Obama as a financial regulator and uh, kind of gave a speech that, oh, maybe, maybe we have to dismantle some banks and break them up. And since the Trump administration is in, he's been working on deregulating banks. So he, he does what the boss, so to speak, tells him to do. Regarding monetary policy, yeah, some people say he has this or that view, but he's just echoed whatever the chair's position was at the time. And so uh, that to, and some people will say, oh, that means he's going to do whatever Trump is going to do if he becomes the chair. Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, really would love to have Powell. My view is that the, the guy is intelligent. I, I have no grudge against him. But because he doesn't have any view on monetary policy, 
somebody else will be the most important person. I happen to think that in this case it's going to be the vice chair. Historically, the vice chair of the Fed is a purely ceremonial role, but it is likely to be either Taylor or Walsh. Of the two, different sort of scenarios can happen. Walsh is somebody who really wants to clean up the Fed, doesn't like the way it's run, and I think Walsh would love to have the job, and he could do that. Taylor is an accomplished person in his own right, has very strong views, and I don't know whether he wants to be the second in command. Uh, he might be convinced if he thinks he can control Powell, he would be the quote-unquote more hawkish choice of, of all of the bunch. There is little doubt the Fed's extraordinary stimulus over the past decade has achieved some of the results they wanted. We've got higher asset prices and even some economic growth. But to us and a lot of other Fed critics, the question was never whether a few trillion dollars of quantitative easing and zero interest rates would produce result. Uh, the question was whether there would actually be real economic growth or if the Fed would simply blow up another bubble, creating even bigger consequences when the bubble pops. Perhaps the question is about to get answered. Uh, the Fed is in the middle of a modest rate hike cycle. Uh, do you think officials there are serious about normalizing rates? And if they do jack up rates a whole lot more, uh, what do you expect the markets will react to this? Well, if Janet Yellen were serious, she would tell us where we're going. Um, she hasn't said where she wants to take the balance sheet because the FOMC has no clue and she has no clue. So in that sense, it's very important who's going to succeed. Powell won't have a clue either. Both John Taylor and Kevin Walsh do not like to have excess reserve in the systems and would unwind the balance sheet probably faster than others. And so it, it is incredibly important who's going to succeed Yellen. And in that sense, it's, if it's Powell, it's very important who's going to be the vice chair. And by the way, there's another scenario that just some technocrat at the staff of the Fed is going to become very important and, and influence things because ultimately all these lawyers who are on the governing side of the Fed, not the regional presidents, they have no clue about monetary policy. They don't have their own staff. So they just look at all at the presentation during the FOMC meeting and then do whatever the chair says. And so it's possible that some, some back office person gains influence. But back to your question. QE, the one thing it has achieved, in my view, it has compressed risk premium. That means risk assets, everything from junk bonds to, to equities, uh, have a very low risk premium. That means junk bonds don't yield much. That means volatility in the market is very low, in the stock market is very low. And when you have quantitative tightening, and it is not, even under the program uh, suggested by, by Yellen, that the one that we're about to embark on, it is not watching paint dry on a wall. Risk premium, to me, almost by definition, have to expand. That means means volatility is going to go up, and that provides a headwind to risk assets. That means everything else equal, prices are lower. And that's one of the reasons why even with the quote-unquote tightening, I'm positive, at least on the, on the precious metals, on, on gold in particular, um, because there's, there's less economic component in, on, on that side. And so it's a more pure reflection of the monetary conditions. And if, if financial conditions tighten, and that's, by the way, the definition of, um, of raising rates or quantitative tightening, um, then equity prices are at risk and, and something like gold may do quite well in that sort of environment. Kind of leads me right in my next question, and I'll ask you to expand a little bit there on, on that the last part of your answer. One of the challenges in the metals markets right now is the U.S. retail investors just aren't buying a lot of safe havens. As, as you mentioned, either there isn't much perception of risk or perhaps people can see risk but discount it because they expect the Fed will step in with their magic money machine if problems arise. In any event, it looks like the metals markets are waiting for some catalyst to introduce the notion of risk to the markets. Do you see anything uh, developing right now that might shock the markets to give metals a boost? Well, hey. hey. A, a big voice in the gold market mentioned to me the other day, why should retail buy gold anymore? America's going to be great again. Ever since Trump got elected, a big segment of the retail sector lost interest. What I have seen, and I, I, I can't really talk to that, I, what, I, what I have seen is that on the professional side, the in, interest has increased substantially. And the reason it has increased is that if you think about what are you going to do with your money, everything is expensive and uh, you're just going to hold your nose and continue buying the stuff. And, and some people do, and obviously many people do to a significant extent. But how do you diversify? Now, cash is one thing. But if you're a professional, you don't earn any money on cash. And so you're not going to use cash. Uh, and, and so gold is just the easiest diversifier. And I, I emphasize easy rather than best. I, I like gold by all means, but uh, there are other things you can use to diversify. It's easy because 
it's easily understood. And the correlation of gold to other assets is, to S&P in particular, is zero over the long term. Uh, and then I mentioned as risk premia go up, gold may do very well. So from that point of view, um, for fresh investors, increasingly use it to diversify. As far as retail is concerned, Obviously, they are confused, and if you're not confused, you haven't paid attention. My view is the Fed is behind the curve, at least under Yellen, and will continue to be behind the curve. If we get someone like John Taylor, who is um, considered to be more hawkish, then odds are, yep, rates are going to move higher. Ultimately, it matters where real rates are going to be. In every bear market in stocks since the 1970s, gold has done very well, with the big exception of the early 80s, where Volcker put real interest rates up very, very much. Now, if you think that a John Taylor can do that, by all means, stay away from gold. My take is the initial reaction of a Taylor is likely to be that maybe bonds will sell off. That means yields will be higher. Maybe that's a negative for gold. But very quickly thereafter, and I don't think it may be months, it could be minutes, uh, people are going to realize, oh, my God, that tightening is going to be best bad for risk assets. And what happens if you have a sell-off in equities, if you have a sell-off in junk bonds? Where does that money go? Well, it tends to go into treasuries. And so that means the long-term rates are not going to move up. All this, the, the Fed is trying to explain to you that, that getting out of the quantitative easing, out of this big balance sheet, is going to raise long-term interest rates. I'm not so sure it will, um, because I see substantial volatility in the market, and that will keep those yields lower. And so in that sort of environment, I happen to think that gold is, is as, as good a diversifier as ever. Remember, uh, no, with, historically, gold has, has done well. People are always worried about what it's going to do tomorrow. The truth of the matter is gold doesn't really do anything because gold doesn't change. Right, exactly. It's the fiat uh, money that uh, that changes value. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, gold is really an anti-dollar investment. And since you've made a name for yourself over the years as a guy who follows the currency markets probably as closely as anyone, uh, let's talk about the U.S. dollar here a little bit more. Uh, now, metals fared pretty well during the first half of the year as the greenback slipped to multi-year lows. In recent weeks, however, uh, the dollar has perked up and metals have stalled. Uh, have we seen a short-term bottom in the dollar or is this rally likely to fail? Well, the, the dollar bulls will never shut up. Let's put it this way. And just as we talked, the European Central Bank just had a meeting, and there wasn't a big surprise. Mr. Draghi said he can do more if he wants to. That said, even Mr. Draghi is, is starting October 2018, um, later than he, obviously, is expected not to print any more money. That means the printing presses are grinding to a hold throughout the world. It's, it's happening in stages, and there are some changes happening. Now, remember, when the Fed first started talking about tapering, they talked and talked and talked and didn't do anything. But for years, the dollar was grinding higher. And then when they finally acted, the dollar weakened. So now uh, you have the Europeans that are expected to taper, to expected to print less money. And the, the expectation of that has, has pushed the, the euro from about 105 to 117 or so. And, and so that is going to continue to happen. And the short of it is that in the U.S., we're much further along. In fact, I think in the U.S., we're closer to the end of the tightening cycle. And in Europe, we're in the beginning of the tightening cycle. So, yes, there are people that say, hey, in the U.S., we're going to have a hawkish uh, Fed person and this and this. Uh, I would never bet on the conventional wisdom that that's exactly how it's going to happen and, and going to translate. If we're going to have a, a risk-off environment, Treasury is going to rally. Uh, people have this conception that the dollar is going to rally in a risk-off environment. We had that in 2008. But if you look at uh, the last two years, whenever we've had a risk-off environment, we didn't have a substantial one, I grant you, the euro rallied. And the reason the euro rallied is because the euro has become a funding currency. People borrow in euros because interest rates are negative. They're so down low. And so it's acting much more like the yen. And so these correlations are morphing. They're not stable. I would be very hesitant to say that, especially with the budget deficits that are going to blow out in the U.S., potentially anyway, that the dollar is the one that's really going to rule the day here. So I'd be very, very cautious about jumping on the, on the bandwagon of the conventional wisdom here. Well, finally, as uh, we uh, wrap up here, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Anything that you're focusing on specifically over the short term? Well, uh, I happen to believe that investors should stress test their portfolios, that if and when the buy the dip mentality is over, that they'll be okay with that. I happen to think diversification is not that you move from one sector to the other, but you actually think about um, how to 
generate uncorrelated returns in, in, in other ways. And then one of the things we're digging into quite quite deeply are, are just what's going to happen here on both on the long and the short end of the yield curve in, in various countries around the world. I don't think that the low rates in the Eurozone are sustainable, despite what Mr. Draghi is trying to tell us. And so there will be some repricing of risk. And, uh, and by the way, even though the exact opposite is in the news, of course, today, as we talk anyway, with the European Central Bank sticking where it are, if they are going to be more assertive ultimately, because Mr. Draghi's term is also going to be up at some point, he's going to stick around for a little while longer, and then, then there's going to be a repricing there. And so, again, um, things are not going to evolve the way that everybody's telling you. I'd be very cautious about risk assets. I would not bet that the dollar is going to be, be, be the big winner. I would not bet that treasuries are going to sell off too much, and not because I don't think that deficits are not going to blow it up or, or maybe the quantitative tightening will, but that the risk-off environment, the volatility, is going to push money into treasuries. And so those waiting for this big treasury sell-off may have to wait. And then with regards to broader commodities, a lot of it depends on China that we haven't talked about. And uh, that's, of course, a big wild card um, because who knows what's going to happen there. Well, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, thanks for the fantastic insights, Axel. It was great to have you back on, and we really appreciate your time today. Now, before we let you go, please tell listeners a little bit more about your firm and your services, and then also how they can follow you more closely. Sure. Well, come to, to our website, AmericanInvestments.com. Follow me on Twitter, or on LinkedIn, um, uh, Axel Merck, is, uh, you can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn, wherever you want. Uh, we have a newsletter. Live tweeting is really the best way you can get the direct interpretation of the news. Anybody can curate their own news channel on, on Twitter, but folks who don't like it, LinkedIn is, is okay as well. Um, it's a little bit more in-depth for those sort of things. We do have some investment products uh, focused on currencies and precious metals. Uh, look it up on, on the website. So browse around on the website, but by all means, engage by by following me on, on Twitter, LinkedIn, or, or even Facebook. Well, great stuff. Thanks again, Axel. We look forward to checking back with you down the road and uh, get more of your thoughts on these ever-changing markets. Uh, take care, yeah. and thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Well, that will do it for this week. Thanks again to Axel Merck, President and Chief Investment Officer of Merck Investments, Manager of the Merck Funds. For more information, be sure to check out MerckInvestments.com. And check back here next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Until then, this has been Mike Leeson with Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by between 7 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time, Monday through Friday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.